سيدات سادتي من فضلكم رحبوا معنا بي زميل أول في انستيتيوت فور ستيت افكتيفنس مينا العريبي وضيوفها الكرام Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Senior Fellow, Institute for State Effectiveness, Mina al oraibi and her panel. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's session on the challenges of the workplace, but also the opportunities that lie with all the changes that we're witnessing. My name is Mina Al-Arabi, and it gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's sessions. Um, we have a great panel here, but we really want to make sure this panel is interactive because we want to hear from you as much as we want to hear from the panel. We welcome your questions once we get started. Um, I have with me here uh, Fahd Rashid, who's Group CEO and Managing Director of Amar Economic City, leading the charge with King Abdullah Economic City. And Sebastian Bazan is um, Chairman and CEO of Accor Hotels. Next to him is Dave McClure from Silicon Valley. He is venture capitalist and founding partner at 500 Startups. We like your t-shirts with uh, our numerals there, 500. And uh, Stephen Park, who's co-founder at True North, all the way here from South Korea. So, um, Sebastian, if I can start with you. We're sure. discussing here on the panel issues to do with globalization, uh, technology, automation, all affecting the workplace, and especially this idea of a clash of genera generations. Do we have a clash between different generations? And how does a traditional company that is very well known, Accor Hotels and others, deal with the fact that most companies that are rising up today and getting international knowledge is that that is being set up by millennials? How do you prepare your workforce for that? Well, Mina, it's, I'm going to be answering in a very easy manner. If we don't adapt to the new generation, we will die. The, when you see the world for the last 15 years, we live in an enormous mutation. And the mutations has a very simple consequences for me as an old traditional company. For 40 years, 1960 to 2000, Anaco Hotel is one of the biggest hotel companies in the world. We have 240,000 people in 95 countries. From 1960 to 2000, Hyatt, Marriott, Intercom, Starwood, Hilton, Accor, we had 90% of the profit, 10% went in the hands of travel agents. Since 2000, for the last 15 years, uh, now I have probably 70% of the profit, traditional travel agents 5%, new startup companies 25% in only 15 years. Booking.com is worth more than all the hotel companies together. And booking did not exist 15 years ago. So then you basically question yourself and you say, if you want to adapt and if you want to have the same growth as the digital companies, and Dave's going to be here to contradict me, for me, all those startups have five things in common. The first thing, and I'm looking at each of you here, 90% of them have been created by people underneath 35 years old. Mm -hmm. 90% of the new startups have been created on a blank sheet of paper, no legacy. 90% have a better technology than the technology existing. 90% of them decided that the audience is the world, not the city in which they live. And 90% of them have an horizontal organization. Look at my company, look at IBM, look at all those big companies. 90% of us, we run by people over 50 years old. 90% of us, we have a vertical pyramidal organization. So if you don't accept to give some autonomy to identify the millennials and to give them power, 
then we're never going to be able to predict the future because those millennials have a capacity to predict the future which is 10 or 20 times better than mine. So what we have done is we decided that we created an executive shadow comex where I have 13 best millennials, seven women, six men, between 25 and 35 years old. 100% of all the confidential information that I have access to, 100% of all the agenda of my executive committee is in the hands of the millennials. They decide before me and I don't make any decision for the last 12 months without first listening to what they have to tell me because they see the world differently from me. So either you adapt and you recognize this and you share power or you want to continue the way we've been doing it for the last 15 years and you're going to be miserably dying. But what is also the challenge from that? I mean, we often hear about the positive uh, take from involving millennials. Do you find challenges in that, especially in terms of, of culture between your young-ish state and those who are uh, a few years younger? Well, the, the biggest challenge is for the people with 25 years of experience, and they're very good, all those people between 45 and 60 years old, is for them to accept to share power with a young guy. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty is to tell the young guy, even though you give him power, he has to respect the old guys. So they have to listen to each other and they have to accept that they may have a different brain they have to work together. Mm -hmm. the, so that, and then the biggest difference also is when you look at companies like my size with 240,000 people, to adapt to the new world, you have three buckets. A third of my people are extremely good and probably locomotive in the world of tomorrow. And they could be the best soldier. A third, they understand the world we live in, but they don't know how to adapt. They need to be trained. Mm -hmm. And a third of my people they don't understand the world we live in. They're resisting. They don't want to be part of it. They don't want to be trained, but you have to preserve their job. Mm -hmm. So the agility of a company like mine is far less than the agility of startups because I have the legacy of 60 years of history, and it's my job to preserve as many people as I can. So, and then the second thing is gender parity between the women and the boys. We, we're part of a big program called a United Nation called He for She. I became CEO and chairman three years ago, and I decided that there is no reason in the world why a woman with the exact same job of a man should be paid less. Absolutely no reason. And I've been, I've been asking for people to give me reasons. So we, decide, we decided that over three years maximum, I will have equal pay between men and women. And some of my board members asked me, but how much it will cost? And I, re I sincerely said, I don't know and I do not want to know because if I know, you would not let me do it. Mm -hmm. So within 2017, we'll have equal pay. Now I have to have equal also parity in terms of power. Mm -hmm. And that needs probably five or six years to build up. But it's not women against the men. It's the men who have to realize that I guess we're going to be so much better off if we have equal sharing at the executive, co executive committee level, which is why we started with the shadow comics. Mm -hmm. So just work on it. Don't diverge from it. And it's my obligation. Excellent. Well, Dave, I want to ask you, you co-founded your company with uh, a woman, but also you deal with uh, millennials, startups, uh, and you choose who you invest in. So <laughs> how do you choose? that right, what is that perfect profile today for a startup that works in challenging times? I think a lot of my formative experiences uh, when I was growing up, my mom was uh, a single parent for a good part of the time when I was growing up and she was an entrepreneur. So uh, for me, it's not really an unfamiliar thing to have a woman in a strong position of authority. That's kind of my default setting. Um, and when I started 500 Startups, I did that with uh, Christine was a uh, uh, at Google for a few years. I came out of PayPal and we started the company together. Um, so we didn't have to necessarily overcome a lot of uh, gender parity issues. We kind of started off that way um, and the company's kind of built out that way. Um, but I think when we look out at what kind of team we're trying to build and, in, and really what kind of companies we're trying to invest in, I, I don't think it's necessarily an issue of morality. In fact, I think it's, you know, kind of to say this, that people might find it offensive, but it's more an issue of greed. We actually think that betting on women and minorities and a lot of other sort of, what I would say, P 
people that are um, underestimated uh, gives us an advantage and an economic sort of return. So we kind of like to say that we're arbitraging racism and sexism around the world for our own benefit. <laughs> uh, and we think that that's a strong economic bet. Now, there's also you know, what we think is a moral imperative behind that, but we don't present that as a social impact issue. Uh, we view that in purely economic terms. We're a for-profit venture capital fund. Um, I think if you extend that to looking at sort of youth and maybe even other areas that people might not always consider that are a wide range of sort of different behaviors, uh, we think that those are also going to be a place where we can discover tremendous talent that's usually underpriced in the market. Uh, those people tend to work harder. Uh, they are often smarter because they've had adversity that they've had to figure out. Uh, and they're incredibly loyal to organizations that give them an opportunity uh, when most of the rest of the organizations don't always do that. Um, in particular, we've hired a lot of folks who are in their 20s. Uh, we actually have fund managers who are doing, running our fund in Korea. Uh, Tim was an entrepreneur we invested in who is uh, at the age of 19, uh, dropped out of Babson to do a startup. Uh, he had, you know, a successful experience fundraising, not so successful experience with the startup, and he started working for us, uh, and then he expressed an interest in going after investing in Korea, which is a tremendous growth market for startups. Um, it's really unusual to give someone investment decision-making authority at the age of 25, mm -hmm. uh, but for us, we think that risk is, you know, greatly offset by the fact that when he is in his 30s, he's going to be a tremendously experienced, you know, investor. Uh, same thing, another woman on our, our team, uh, Tanya Soman, uh, is leading an investment group in beauty and, fine, and fashion, uh, also in, in her mid-20s. So we take risks when we're kind of doing that with people who maybe don't have quite as much experience, but the payoff is super huge whenever things succeed. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the last thing I'd like to kind of mention is we, we had some interesting things happen in the U.S. election uh, yes. last week, and I would say that, uh, personally speaking, I wish that that had gone a different direction. Uh, I'm trying to find some positives in, in how we look at that going forward over the next four years. Um, I think we're going to have a really great opportunity to emphasize diversity of opinions and in the workplace. Uh, we might face some headwinds with, uh, I think, some role models in the new administration that aren't exactly what I think should be presented to our kids and to lots of other uh, people. I think we need to work really extra hard to promote uh, immigration to promote diversity in the workplace, uh, to show that you know women are not just objects, <laughs> that women are leaders, and that women deserve respect uh, in many ways, uh, and that when people exhibit behaviors that aren't respectful of those, that we reject those behaviors. Um, because that's one of the challenges, to ensure diversity and allow people to be different, but at the same time to have a base of respect for others and the differences. So how to maintain those two. In a way, um, I want to come to you, Fahad, because of course you are creating a city. You know, Some of the legacy issues exist, but at the same time, you're preparing human capital for a whole new experience. So how do you prepare that human capital for King Abdullah Economic City and uh, the ventures that are coming out in Saudi Arabia? Uh, thank you, Mina. Well, first of all, we realize that as city builders, that the city space is the most competitive space in the world. There are 247,000 cities around the world competing really for capital and for talent. And if you look at the Saudi context, you will find that 65% of the population is under 30. In fact, by 2020, 65% of the working population will be the younger millennial generation. Mm -hmm. So for Cake to succeed, we must provide an environment where our youth can succeed and can unleash their potential. So we're doing lots of things, both on the employment front, but also on the incubation front. So we're creating an industrial incubator, a culinary incubator, an art incubator, an art and, um, uh, um, 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 and uh, a services incubator. But we're really focusing also on unleashing the human capital potential of this country. And we're doing that uh, really, uh, the main engine of it is going to be the Mohammed bin Salman College for Business and Entrepreneurship. It's a new college that we've launched with MISC, with, uh, with uh, Lockheed Martin, as well as Babson uh, College out of the US. And here we really want to reinvent the business of um, leadership. We're talking about not teaching students that come to us uh, entrepreneurial skill sets, but the art, uh, entrepreneurial mindset. Because entrepreneurship 
pr uh, pervades in different sectors. So it could be in the nonprofit sector, it could be in government, as well as business and startups. So you have to teach the entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. And it can't be just a business school, it has to be a leadership school where you teach people the business skill sets that are applied. And we're doing this through so many things. One is obviously our educational uh, methods, so we're focused on Yes, the academics, we're going to teach you the marketing, we're going to teach you the statistics, the accounting, but also focusing on uh, softer skills like leadership skills, interpersonal skills, um, negotiation skills, and other applied skills, as well as having centers of excellence. So we are focused on this from a human capital perspective because we believe that this next generation, you really can't tell them what to do. They will tell you where to take this world. It's theirs. Mm -hmm. Stephen, would you agree with that, Stephen, that you can't tell this generation where to go, they are leading. Uh, quite often you hear people saying, you know, the youth are the leaders of tomorrow, but I would say they're the leaders of today. They're, they've already started. So your experience has been quite uh, unique in some ways, but in other ways is telling of the globalized world we live in. Um, so I'd like to ask you about how you can um, create a workforce that holds these values that are transferable in different uh, parts of the world, but also keeping in mind the intergenerational differences. Do you think there is a clash? Um, definitely, there is a clash. Um, we are, being very frank is important when creating an organization that can trust itself. And in today's world where everything's interconnected, especially from the young generation, they know that the world is different and is diverse. They're not the only one living in this planet. Um, creating trust in an organization and being able to frankly say things as is and being brutally honest is what I think is crucial um, in facilitating um, overcoming crashes, uh, clashes of generations. And young people also have to have a mindset of listening and uh, trying to acquire um, the previous knowledge that was accumulated by the older generations. And I really believe that an organization that has that frankness and also the capacity to learn and listen from the older generations can pr promote innovation and make the world a better place. Okay, with that task of making the world a better place, but also really uh, listening, we'd like to hear from, from the audience your questions. Um, if you have it for a specific speaker, please identify them. Otherwise, feel free to ask and we'll have one of our panelists speak. So please raise your hand. We have mics going around. I have a question right here, if we can go there first, and then to the gentleman in the second row here. So we'll start here. We'll just get the mic to you. It's coming over now. Sorry, we're having problems with the mic. If we can get the mic here to the gentleman in the second row here so we can start preparing just in case there's a problem with the mics. I apologize for this, but we wanna make sure everybody can hear the question. So a mic here, please. Okay, no? Okay. I have a question. How important are soft skills, life skills, and personal development skills for the youth of Saudi Arabia? Because what I think this area needs to be more focused in the education sector. How much important for a Saudi youth to indulge them in soft skills, life skills, interpersonal yes, skills, and Thank also you. all these kinds of skills. Thank you. Um, Fahad, do you want to tackle that one? Sure. Um, I, I graduated from business school about, I would say, I don't want to say my age, 13 years ago, let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> I miss being a millennial by five years. Uh, so, but um, I really realized that over the past 13 years, I've also learned so much on the job, um, on leadership, on applied skills, uh, little things from negotiation, although I had negotiation classes, speaking classes, etc. And I think what we need to do is encapsulate such a learning, that decade of learning post-graduation, uh, into almost, uh, if you will, modules or even pills that, uh, that students can take. How can you compress this experience, experience, this learning that I've had on the job and so many of the successful executives in the kingdom have had and actually teach it while, people are, uh, while students are at the school, um, learning um, in, a, in a business school and a leadership context. And that's what we're trying to do and trying to figure, in, uh, figure out. And this comes really through experiential learning. So focusing on actual uh, uh, situations 
whether through case studies or actual applied um, uh, teaching methodology for the students to learn from. Okay, thank you. We've got the mic working here now, please. Hi, my question is around managing across generations. Um, so I think maybe Sebastian, Dave, or Stephen could speak to this. Um, so when you're working in a startup and you're often working with people of um, many different generations, do you guys have any tips on, you know, as a, as a young person who's in a senior role um, who needs to actually manage people with much more experience than they do, um, how do you tackle the sensitivities with that? Well, I'm looking for the answer. So if you can give me the answer, it'd be actually great. Uh, no, seriously, it's, it is extremely difficult. It is difficult because people do not recognize the differences. So if you're a young global leader, if you have power on an old generation, the first thing you need is to be humble. It's not because you're smarter than somebody else so that you have to be condescendent. So the more humble you are, which is back to your question, sir, on the biggest qualities for any individuals, regardless of the age, is the way they behave, the way they interact, the way they show respect. The more, the smarter you are, the more you have to be respectful for somebody else's because that other, per that other person will then respect your, your position, your brain, and your power. If you want to impose on anyone, whether it's a young people or an old people, don't even think of it if you first are not good listener. So my, which is why for me, business skill is number three. First is who are you? What's your education? What's your values in life? What's your purpose? What do you want to leave behind you? Except your name. Don't ever impose your name or your status to anyone. Dave, go ahead. Uh, I think maybe in technology sort of world, there's a slightly different sort of framework because authority and seniority aren't always coming from the top. Um, in fact, a lot of times we have the exact opposite set of issues is that uh, folks with seniority are not always respected in technology environments and usually folks who are younger have more domain expertise skills, particularly in tech. Um, so. In most cases, we're trying to develop an environment where we give decision-making authority uh, as far down the food chain as we possibly can. Uh, and we try and involve you know, young and new people in the organization uh, in our investing strategies immediately when they come in the door. So in a typical venture capital firm, you have a lot of people coming in new who are playing an associate role or a principal role. They're doing a lot of grunt work, a lot of research. Uh, and they're helping older people make decisions. Uh, I think if we want to develop the team and really give them a sense of ownership, we have to get them started like right away. And so we have a strategy where we let people make a lot of small investments and we kind of try and have them do that almost from the very beginning. Either they're working in our accelerator environment and they're making investment selections and decisions along with folks who are older, more senior, um, but they're also kind of helping us discover things. Uh, Again, a younger woman on our team who's in her 20s is really helpful for us to understand fashion. She's helpful for us to understand Snapchat. Uh, turns out she ends up being one of our best pitch coaches, uh, even among people who've been around for 10 or 15 years. Um, so a lot of times the respect and sort of managing you know, situation is going to go both ways. Um, when I first started working at PayPal, I was 35. Most of the people in PayPal were in their 20s and 30s, and I was the one that was actually at a disadvantage trying to keep up with people who were sort of you know, seen as movers and shakers in that organization. Um, I think the other thing is you want to build an environment that's really uh, gives people a sense of trust and safety so that they can take risk uh, and also is willing to be transparent about things that aren't working. So if things that aren't going you know, in a positive direction, you want to be upfront about the feedback so that they can, you know, try and use that feedback to course correct. Uh, whether that's an old person or young person, sometimes if you're trying to be too polite, you're not actually being effective and kind of giving people the feedback that they need to grow. Orderly disruption. <laughs> What's that? Well, it's not always orderly, and I think, you know, we really struggle a lot of times because the people that we have in the organization about half the teams in California, but the other half of the team is spread across 20 other countries. Uh, we have lots of different people in the organization. Uh, we have Arabs, we have Jews, we have 
people in lots of different like seniority positions, junior positions. Uh, understanding of humor and culture isn't going to be the same. Uh, one thing we've noticed is that this may sound silly, but the use of emoji and pictures actually is cross-cultural a lot more than than words. So even though most of the people in the company speak English, right. sometimes they'll misinterpret English and you know a lot of cultural idiosyncrasies. So uh, emoji are less easily misinterpreted than language, <laughs> and also they're fun. So that's a great okay. part of the workplace as well. Right. I'll go to the next question. Um, we have a question right there. Yeah. Go ahead. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mohammed Ashur. I'm an industrial engineering graduate from Afesa University. Uh, two brief questions. Uh, the first one for Mr. Fahad, yes. and the other uh, for all of you, please. The first one, Mr. Fahad, um, uh, we're, I'm honored to, to see you in person. I had uh, the chance to, to see you earlier, but I couldn't ask you everything I wanted. <laughs> I want to ask how close as youth we can be to help you plan the College of Entrepreneurship that his Royal Highness Prince Mohammed bin Salman started. Uh, for me, I've been in, humbly in the entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship field for seven years, and I barely got the information I needed about the college. I'm sure now it's in the strategic build-up uh, stage, but we'd like to know more so we can actually contribute to building this strategy. As youth perspective, the other question is, Mr. Sebastian, sir, you mentioned that 90% of the companies are led by elderly people. Now we're in the era of information technology. That's the new generation, and that's the new business that will make money in the future. How can we, as youth, make it more sense for businesses, stakeholders, uh, elder management to actually trust us more when it comes to us leading the innovation forward? I'm sure the technology has been there for like 150 years. But now, the way we use the technology is way different. So that's the question for the four of you, please, if you answer me. Thank you so much. Sure. Ahead, if we start with you for the sure. first question. Uh, let, yeah, the, the, the question on how to engage in the school, is, this school has to be a school that is very much um, um, uh, integrates both what the youth uh, is doing and also what business and government and, uh, and the uh, non-for-profit sector is doing. So we have um, decided to become the human capital engine for Vision 2030. We want to pre prepare for the future um, of this country and we will definitely engage uh, you and others who are interested in both attending the school but also uh, impacting its outcomes. Uh, in what we do. So you have my contacts. Anybody who's interested also can connect with me right afterwards. Uh, would love to uh, have you also visit the school and see what we're doing there. Uh, I think you'll be impressed and you'll contribute in a big way to this future. Thank you. Well, on, on data, let, let me tell you what I, what I think, for, which is striking, by the way. For 200 years, 19th century, 20th century, we've been in a world of production, a new product. For 20 years, the last 20 years, we've been in a world of information, data. We're already in world number three, which is a world of recommendation. None of you in the room now are making a decision without first looking for what other people have thoughts of where you might be going, booking, or buying. None of you. Even though you don't know the people who are actually recommending, but because there's so much volume that I get you trust them. So if you look at all the industry in the world, the data information is immensely valuable, except one thing. 80% of the data in the world is shared by many people, so it's valueless. Probably 16% of the information has enormous value, but they're missing either technology to extract information, or they're missing the right questions, or they're missing data analysts. Only 4% of the big companies have used data to transform their own businesses and to make a big difference. I'll give you a food for thought in one second. My industry has been only dedicated to travelers, which being 100% of my client, which is 200 million a year. I'm saying we missed the boat. I'd never addressed any services to the local inhabitants, even though they know of my hotel, Sofitel, Pullman, Raffles, Ibis, but they never dared coming into my hotel because they're afraid somebody's gonna ask them, what's your room number? And they don't have a room number because they don't need a room because they live next door. All the startups company have been based on how to ease quality of life. 
e-commerce, crowdfunding, Uber of the world. I can guarantee you that with 4,000 hotels in 95 countries, I can ease quality of life for 6 billion inhabitants who never entered my hotels before. So it's data-driven, information-driven, but it's process-driven. I think, I think that's a really great perspective to think of your business outside the normal environment that it operates. Um, I think looking at uh, how education is changing is kind of one area we've been trying to spend a lot of time. Uh, how do we deliver education at scale around the world, maybe in different institutions you know, than just traditional universities? Um, I happen to have the chance to work with some of the founders of YouTube when I was at PayPal. Uh, we've been investors in companies that are trying to use video and education like Udemy. Uh, here in the region, we're investors in U-Turn and Karabish. And I think um, starting to look at different ways that we think about education that aren't just always in a course environment, in a testing environment, uh, how do we use more fun and interesting and engaging sort of uh, medium that are familiar again to youth? So looking at mobile video, uh, looking at sort of connecting people with education environments, platforms for pictures and video. Uh, so these days, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Snap, uh, Pinterest, uh, obviously Instagram is super popular in the region. Um, those are not just kind of Playgrounds. They're actually ways that people can combine education and learning with things that are fun. And I think you get a more, you know, informed and more fun, you know, education kind of environment. So how do we kind of take traditional education and learning out of maybe the business school or out of the academic environment? And how do we turn that into an everyday experience for people to take home in their pocket and uh, basically carry around with them all the time? Stephen, do you want to add to that from your experience, how we can harness all the tools that are available now for different types of education? Mm, so, um, I was born in Korea, but I grew up in the Philippines and I worked in the military, the federal government, OECD. A lot of different experiences have been earned. Um, and from there, I realized that every individual has different views of how they see the world and also has different values. Uh, on how they make decisions. I think education and has to be tailored around that, like how um, people, people interpret the world and people who are now different, younger generations, they're learning from open source educational systems and tailoring them to make uh, the world a better place in their own ways. So I think uh, fundamentally everyone has to learn and have a core education, but they should have their own value propositions, va value sets, and um, have their own philosophy on how to contribute to the society and make the world a better place. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've had uh, somebody waiting here patiently, and then we'll go to the middle of the back there. Thanks, Mina. Uh, my name is Alim from the Lighthouse Strategy in Australia. We're a social impact um, consultancy, and a lot of what we do is try to innovatively solve issues that disproportionately impact culturally and, linguist and linguistically diverse communities. Um, there's a lot of talk, particularly at security conferences, and my question is to you, Dave, um, around the role of Silicon Valley in countering violent extremism. What's your in perspective? Countering violent, violent extremism? Um, my question is, what do you think the role is of the technology sector, the startup ecosystem, um, in solving social impact issues, and particularly those that are highly politicized? So, well, we, we will take the question, but let's try to stay within the topic for one reason, is that I think there's a lot that can be said also about finding purpose in your work, that if you feel that through these different platforms, you can actually contribute in a wider space, including countering uh, extremism. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, we've, we've had a very topical experience right now about having two different sort of very violently different perspectives in the US. Uh, those have been represented by, you know, two different you know, party systems, but uh, what's been unfortunate about that is those two uh, groups don't really see much of how the other side lives. Uh, I think a lot of the concern in the US about immigration, about concern about Hispanic, black, Muslims, is because uh, a lot of folks don't have any direct experience with those groups. Uh, so even though there's been a lot of violent exchanges happening in the U.S., uh, both in terms of 
you know, verbal violent exchanges and others. Um, I think that's hopefully on a path towards hearing the other person's perspective and getting more of that. The concerns that I have right now is that we have talk shows, we have cable news networks, we even have Facebook and Twitter where people are just listening to the perspectives that they are comfortable with and it becomes an echo chamber. Even in technology sectors in Silicon Valley, we don't have as much experience with people who come from you know, less urban environments, uh, maybe more poor and less educated environments. Uh, my family grew up in West Virginia. I still have people back uh, in that state. That was a very red state lately. Uh, I don't think a lot of the peers that I work with in Silicon Valley always relate to that world. Uh, at the same time, I've also had some you know, travel experiences around the world that have given me a chance to learn more. Um, I'm on the board of a company here called Unifonic that was founded out of Saudi, and I've had through those experiences the chances to really you know, establish friendships with, with Saudis for the last two years, and it's changed dramatically you know, how I view the world. Um, I don't think that the typical American in the middle Midwestern states and in small cities gets that experience. Um, I think that that's really tough. And so, especially in the sort of different political environment that we have right now and where there's a lot of, you know, a lot of very unhappy people on both sides that are threatening use of violence, uh, I think we gotta take an extra step to really get people to understand what the alternative perspectives are about, really get people to experience, you know, what does it mean to live in a poor working environment? What does it mean to have a different set of, you know, religion or faith or other sort of, you know, alternative life experiences, shall we say? Um, I don't think we're going to solve those problems without trying to understand how the other person sees the world. Okay, so I'm afraid we're running out of time, so I've got three questions. We're going to group them together and then um, ask the panel to answer them. So I have a question here, question at the back, and then finally a question there. So we'll start here, please. Yes, hi everybody. This is Abdullah Tammami, Head of Investment for IMF Technology. Uh, I wanna ask about how can VCs, maybe can Dave can uh, contribute to that and the rest of the panel, VCs, investors, entrepreneurs, help regulators to catch up with technology and how fast that is moving. So with the global countries you invest in, regulations change from one place to another. So how can you invest in a place where regulation is still mm -hmm. catching up to what's allowed and not allowed? Okay, thank you. Question at the back, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Hamad Hazraitan. I'm from King Saud University and King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology. My question comes to the negotiation and uh, respect. I really like that. But sometimes you have different cultures and you have different ages where the definition of respect changes from a place to place or from age to another. So how would you, in an absolute level, recommend people to do when they face a kind of a new generation or a new uh, society to behave in order to convince or show them your respect? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then final question there, please. Hi, I come from a city perspective looking at uh, Silicon Valley a new and an established innovative hub and Cape being a city that's growing uh, into that. What lessons can Cape learn from Silicon Valley in terms of the spatial structure and the kind of spaces for innovation to happen? For innovation to happen, innovation feeds off innovation. So what kind of spaces does the city need to have Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll start with the VC question. I guess, Dave, it was mainly directed trying, at you. I'm trying to remember all those questions. Uh, <laughs> if you can help me I've got them remember. noted. So if you, if you okay. go with the first one on the VCs and all. Uh, sorry, the question was around how does VC catch up with regulatory environments? And exactly. Technologies need certain regulations in order to thrive. You know, I, I think VC is all about busting uh, rules in a lot of ways, so I, I'm not sure... You know, if I reflect back on sort of a lot of the PayPal experience and what we were doing there, we were sort of pushing the envelope of the regulatory environment. Uh, same thing with my friends who started YouTube. In a lot of cases, you know, the DMCA takedowns and things that they were doing were pushing, you know, sort of the edge of copyright law. So I'm, I'm not sure we would, I would probably want to recommend that we take a relatively light touch on regulatory environments and that investors not necessarily play by all the rules. I think we need to be able to be flexible about bending some of those perspectives. 
Um, you know, I, in fact, you know, I think it's really kind of the other way around. It's not that regulatory environments are sort of changing fast, it's more the technology is pushing past mm -hmm. the regulatory environments. If you look at Uber and Airbnb, they're certainly pushing a lot of the existing regulatory environments and you know, structures that were set up before. Um, you would probably argue that those are beneficial to consumers to let those boundaries be pushed. And right now we're seeing that play out in sort of lawsuits both in you know, domestic US as well as around the world. Yeah. Um, I think you know, there are going to be other environments in financial services, in healthcare, in education where maybe you don't want to push those boundaries quite as much. Um, so I think we have to be smart about understanding where have existing regulatory environments safeguarded the benefits of consumers and where are they holding back benefits yeah. for consumers. Mm -hmm. And probably to give a little bit of flexibility for startups and technology innovators to disrupt some of those boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you might not really see the benefits come back to society. I'm actually going to group that with the question about cake and learning from uh, Silicon Valley, because part of it, of course, is about regulation and, and how do you create the space that allows innovation. At the same time, to touch upon the regulation question, that there are certain regulations that need to be eased or, in some cases, put in place. How do you approach it? Well, uh, I spent a couple of years in Silicon Valley and worked for a fuel cell startup there. Um, and I've looked also at all examples around the, the world of cities that try to imitate Silicon Valley. The Silicon Valley, Valley model is, um, is quite unique and it reflects the, the location as well, uh, the joining of the mines, uh, whether the university is there or the venture capitalists or etc. So we need to remember that cities reflect spatially, so physically the way we look at them, they reflect our social, economic, technological, governmental challenges that, and opportunities that we have. So cake physically will never look like Silicon Valley. In, in, in many ways we have a, the Red Sea is more beautiful I think than the uh, Pacific. So, um, um, but what we, would, we do have is huge potential. We have Kaust just south of us. So that is a center for innovation. And we have MBSC, the Mohammed bin Salman College for entrepreneurship. We have all of the incubators. We have uh, companies that are innovative uh, globally, Pfizer, Sanofi, Mars. And we want to attract the creative class, mm -hmm. innovative people who are willing to change the world. And therefore, we are offering incentives as far as uh, five years free rent for office space for companies, innovative companies that want to set up uh, in a King Abdullah Economic City. Even if you want furnished offices, we offer it for three years for free. Uh, we offer um, subsidized housing, free transportation, free education for children. So we're really going after the creative class of Saudi Arabia. And we believe by doing that, we create a, a great uh, uh, innovative environment where people can um, learn from each other. In terms of the government question, the reality around the world is, to be honest, business is always ahead of government in terms of regulations. Because business is on the forefront of what's happening. And in the technological space, this is even far more ahead. And we see uh, governments fighting Uber, for example, or fighting other co uh, companies. Uh, Airbnb now is struggling uh, because hotels are going uh, against it, etc. So, uh, so I think that you know the private sector and the technological companies will always be ahead. It's all about remembering that it cannot be a fight between government and the private sector, and we need to work together. And the best way to work together is because we talk about it a lot and we never do it, is to actually see each other. So private sector individuals going to the government and government individual coming to private sector because as soon as you separate the two for more than five years, you will get a divide that's very hard to bridge. I guess just one point on Silicon Valley. I think sometimes people don't know the history of how some of those uh, first creativity spots were created. They got a lot of support from the defense industry and from, you know, from DOD uh, putting in some initial investments and then, of course, creating its own uh, space. So sometimes it's interesting to look at the history of how some of these places started. I want to wrap up with a very important question about respect because, yes, emojis are one way we can understand each other, interestingly, but also it is true. We are culturally very different and also this idea of intergeneration, what someone would consider respect. I know 
In our culture, if somebody elderly comes into the room, you have to stand up if they're older than you, even if it's only a couple of years. In other cultures, that seems farcical, no need for it. So from those gestures, but also in, in working together at a time where we do see tensions, whether it's in the US or Europe and other parts of the world. So to wrap up, I'd ask each of you to answer that question, how they would address it. Can I start? Uh, I think that in, in Saudi Arabia, respect is a very important component of who we are. Uh, so, I don't think the issue is respect in the form of respect. I think the skill sets between generations are not appreciated uh, or respected, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, because the older generation looks at the younger generation and says, well, you have to earn it. You have to work for 10, 12 years before you get to where you need to get. You have to learn the, the, the right way. And the younger generation are, say, are looking at the older generation and saying, I'm sorry, you're not technologically connected. You don't know our world. And uh, therefore, there is that clash that we talked about. And I think because, uh, because industries are being disrupted, this clash needs to be addressed. And the way to address it is to be focused on innovation and focused on output rather than process. We need to really be focusing on results because ultimately results will drive business, will drive institutions for success and not really on age alone. Okay, Sebastian, please. Well, it's a, it's a difficult question for Probably for me, respects, I mean, respect and trust are values in life. So definition for respect is recognizing, accepting, looking forward for differences of opinion, differences of culture, differences of education, differences of business attitude, and understanding that those differences are enhancing your own behavior as opposed to opposing something to you. So, just, and which is what Dr. Yunus has said, think out of the box. Mm -hmm. So look forward for somebody different because it's gonna make you stronger. Great, Dave? Uh, this is gonna sound a little weird, but uh, for me, uh, process of learning respect is by working and playing and understanding other people. Uh, so I would recommend uh, travel a lot. I waited a little bit too long in my life to do that, but for the last five years, I've been visiting 20 or 30 countries a year. Not everybody gets to do that, <laughs> um, but that's really changed my life dramatically. Uh, virtual travel via social platforms may be another way to, to experience that. Uh, learn a language, learn another language. I think that's probably a great way to sort of, again, experience another perspective, another culture. Uh, and this one maybe doesn't hit everybody, but uh, play an instrument where you're playing with someone else. Um, and so whether that's singing or whether that's playing or playing in a band or singing with other people. Um, or playing you, sports in a team. Uh, that's, that, and that's <laughs> another great one too. That's also a lot of fun. So I think you learn other perspectives. You learn how to try and fit in with a group and you get a different perspective. Okay. Steven. I think trying to be context aware, that aware of the differences, aware of the Clashes, clashes between the, the generations are very important. The, having that attitude allows us to be more harmonious. And sometimes people forget that other people are different and take it for granted that um, it's not all always about them. And being trying to be context over is very important, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Well, I would say also dignity is so important. At the end of the day, many of us look for employment and work as a way to live a dignified life and the dignity of the people you work with and you want to hire, but also, unfortunately, when you have to let them go, always with dignity. I want to thank my panel and thank the audience so much for your engagement. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.